very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to stand and speak to the NDP's opposition motion. Speaker, Canada's Conservatives believe to mitigate climate change, we need to support investments in renewable and clean energy technologies. Canada's Conservatives believe that to become a global leader in clean tech and to ensure that future jobs will be located right here in Canada. We need to make the right choices in those investments. Canada's Conservative Speaker believe that spending billions of taxpayer dollars to buy out the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline and sending that investment south into the United States is not one of those right choices. Canada has a world-leading regulatory regime and an internationally renowned track record of environmentally and socially responsible oil and gas development. And we should be proud of that, Speaker. We should not forfeit Canada's position as a natural resource superpower to grow the clean tech sector. We should leverage it. The challenge for clean technology is to affect that transition by producing more energy while reducing CO2 emissions. This issue affects the entire global community, including consumers of energy. While government plays a role in spurring investment, we must not overlook the role that the private sector and the energy sector specifically plays in driving innovation and clean technology advancements. Andy Brown, the chief executive responsible for Shell's global upstream business, had this to say on the energy, energy transition and the role the sector has in achieving climate change goals. Quoting, a successful energy transition will require vision, urgency, and realism, vision for a long-term approach to policy setting, business planning, and investment, urgency and realism about the scale and costs of orderly transformations both for energy, suppliers, and consumers. Society has to be ambitious to achieve climate change and development goals. Decisions must tackle the breadth and complexity of that challenge. Conversely, rapid, poorly considered, poorly driven changes could result in unexpected consequences and fail to achieve their intended goals. Brown concludes, Speaker. The energy industry must unlock the potential we have for new technology through collaboration and innovation. Last week, Speaker, Ontarians in my riding and across the province sent a strong message to Kathleen Wynne's Liberal government that they had enough of unrealistic and poorly considered environmental policy. It's been nearly a decade since Ontario's Liberals passed the Green Energy Act. A key component of that plan, the FIT and MicroFIT program, saw billions of dollars in green energy contracts awarded to solar and wind companies. The provincial Liberals never provided details of public promises about how much that plan would cost Ontarians, like how their federal cousins won't tell Canadians how much their federal carbon tax scheme will cost Canadian families. Experts advised the government that technologies such as solar power needed to be developed gradually to prevent renewable energy contracts from overwhelming the province's electricity system and sending hydro bills skyrocketing. Ignoring the experts, the province went ahead with unrealistic and poorly considered policies that it knew were going to be costly, ineffective and inefficient. Policies which cost Ontarians billions of dollars and ultimately cost the provincial Liberals official party status. Speaker, this is a lesson this government would be wise to heed. As the Prime Minister shut down pipeline after pipeline and as he ignored the growing uncertainty over the Trans Mountain expansion for over a year and a half, Canadian taxpayers backed into a corner by this government found themselves owning a pipeline Kinder Morgan didn't need to sell. All that was needed was regulatory certainty for a pipeline project that had already met every possible criterion for approval and certainty that the government who had made those approvals would see them through. The ramifications, Speaker, of poorly considered policies like the nationalization of Trans Mountain, the oil tanker ban, the derailing of Energy East, Northern Gateway, and the job killing carbon tax is all too clear as investment flees south of the border to the United States and other international jurisdictions. Royal Bank's President and CEO Dave McKay told the Canadian press that a significant investment exodus to the U.S. is already underway, especially in the energy and clean technology sectors. That's right, Speaker. You know the investment climate 
in Canada is in distress when even investors in renewable energy, where subsidies abound and competing oil and gas face carbon taxes and regulatory excess are leaving because they favor lower U.S. corporate taxes more. NextEra Energy, in early April, said the sale of its wind and solar generation assets in Ontario for uh, sorry, $582 million was specifically motivated by U.S. tax reform. <coughs> Quoting, we expect the sale of the Canadian portfolio to enable us to recycle capital back into U.S. assets, which benefit from a longer federal income tax shield and a lower effective corporate tax rate, unquote. That was Jim Robo, chairman and chief executive officer, said in a statement of NextAir Energy. Latest data from Statistics Canada shows foreign direct investment in the country dropped to $31.4 billion last year compared to $49.4 billion the year before. The rapidly declining investment climate has important and far-reaching consequences. If we want to ensure Canada becomes a global leader in clean tech, and if we want to ensure that future jobs will be located right here in Canada, industry investment will be critical. In 2016, oil and gas business expenditures on research and design was nearly $1.5 billion of the $2 billion that was invested in clean tech R&D in the energy sector. Nearly 10% of all money spent on R&D in Canada was in the energy sector. Enbridge and TransCanada, the country's largest pipeline companies, both invest heavily in renewable energy. CGA, AT Co, Enbridge, Energier, Fortis BC, Pacific Northern Gas, Sask Energy and Union Gas pool capital investment in the Natural Gas Innovation Fund to support clean tech startups who innovate in the natural gas value supply chain. As the potential for renewable energy grows and the cost of technology fails, experts, sorry, that should be false, experts anticipate a growing number of traditional oil and gas companies to invest in the renewable sector. Morgan Bazillion, the former lead energy specialist at the World Bank, told an audience of Calgary oil executives in May that the industry has already seen some of the sector's largest companies, Shell, Total, BP, and others, make billion-dollar investments in renewables. But to get industry investment in clean tech, there must be industry in Canada to begin with. Murphy Oil Group said it would repatriate Canadian retained earnings and that it sees the substantially lower tax rate in the U.S. as a big advantage for capital investments. Dan Tabucci, Chief Market Strategist at Stream Asset Financial Management, LP in Calgary, said in an interview with the Financial Post, oil and gas companies with assets in Canada waited for the Canadian government to respond to U.S. tax reforms in the federal budget when it offered nothing on tax competitiveness. The next step was to look at redeploying their capital, end quote. The Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers in their 2018 report entitled Competitive Climate Policy, Supporting Investment and Innovation, make the case succinctly. The Canadian oil and natural gas sector is supportive of climate policies that are effective and efficient and take into account cumulative impacts, including taxation, market access, and regulatory review process. With the right policies in place, the Canadian industry can be competitive, can attract investment, and can reduce GHG emissions. However, current climate and other policies are inefficient and duplicative and are combining to create unintended consequences such as driving investment away from Canada and into other countries that have less robust emissions reduction policies. This emerging policy environment promotes carbon leakage and therefore does not lead to global emissions reduction. Once again, Speaker, unexpected consequences of poorly considered policies which led to the demise of the Ontario Liberal Party is leading to the demise of the energy sector in Canada and with it the un unintended consequence of carbon leakage. For those not aware, carbon leakage is the shift of greenhouse gas emissions from one part of the world to another, usually because governments implementing uncompetitive policies. An example of carbon leakage can be seen in Canada as this Liberal government's tax policies increase cost to industry and as a result, industry shifts to investment elsewhere. 
the impl implement sorry the implications of carbon leakage are both economic and emission related. Economically, we are seeing reduced investment in Canada and the loss of good-paying jobs for Canadian families. Globally, as investment and jobs shift, we see an increase in emissions because that production is going to get moved to countries that don't have anywhere near Canada's world-leading regulatory regime. There's still time, Speaker. Time to reverse the course of declining investment in Canadian industry. Time to stop carbon leakage and time to support the growing but fragile clean tech industry right here in Canada. Canada's clean tech energy industry now ranks fourth highest globally and first in the G20. Canadian clean tech businesses we're already booming, accounting for 3.1% or $59.3 billion of our GDP. According to the Standing Committee on Natural Resources 2016 report, de-risking the adoption of clean energy technology in Canada's natural resource sector, there were 800 companies who employed 55,300 direct jobs with $17 billion in revenue. Clean tech firms paid 48% more than the Canadian average wage. 11 of the top 100 clean tech companies are in Canada. Global t clean tech market value by trade is $1 trillion. Canada's share is 1.4% or 26th largest in the world. Canada has some great clean tech stories to share, like Montreal-based GHGSAT, which can track global greenhouse gases from any industrial site in the world using a high resolution satellite. This technology, more accurate and affordable than its alternatives, enables oil and gas companies to better understand, control, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Then there is Manitoba-based HD Petroleum, which has created small-scale waste oil micro-refinery units that transform used oil into diesel fuel. The cost of implementing this technology is relatively inexpensive and the recycling process substantially reduces GHG emissions when compared with more traditional oil disposal methods. Or Imagine, Imagineira, which uses clean hydrocarbon ecosystems to deliver energy produced with the use of zero fresh water and with no toxic emissions or air pollutions. Dark Vision which developed a new ultrasound technology that allows companies to create 3D images of the inside of oil wells, enabling them to make more informed and cost-effective production decisions. And another company, which uses artificial intelligence to help oil and gas companies to make better production and operational choices. These are just few of the success stories right here in Canada's clean tech sector, Speaker. But as I've said, it's a fragile sector that needs more than subsidies to thrive. If we are serious about mitigating climate change, if we are serious about becoming a global leader in clean tech and ensuring that future jobs will be in Canada, then we need sound fiscal policies and a competitive tax regime right here in Canada. We need to support the industry that in turn will support the growth of Canada's clean tech sector. Industry leaders have told us, Speaker, they will do this because it makes sense, it's good for business, it's good for the environment in which their families and the families of their employees live, work and play. Speaker, making policy decisions regarding the energy sector is difficult because on one hand we must consider our environmental health and on the other our wealth as a nation. Clean tech isn't meant to make that decision easier. Clean tech is meant to remove the need to make this decision in the first place. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, for the time. I, I do appreciate that, and I look forward to the questions from my honourable colleagues. Questions and comments. Questions and commentaires. The honourable member for Red Deer Mountain View. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I listened with great uh, interest to my colleagues' uh, discussion, especially on, uh, on clean tech. And, of course, one of the issues that has taken place uh, is that there's been a, a great a push to kind of eliminate coal as far as, uh, as an energy source. 
but we had some of the cleanest uh, coal uh, operations uh, in the world and we had the technology that was reducing the greenhouse gases associated with it. But now that that, that industry is under pressure, those that were innovative as far as the greenhouse gas uh, reductions are concerned, they're going to take that technology and they're going to send it around the world. So I wonder if uh, you could perhaps comment on that. And, uh, and the other point that I, I wouldn't mind getting an answer to as well, um, within about five or six miles of, of my place, there's a whole bunch of, of uh, windmills. There's a relationship between how long it is going to take in order to get uh, you know, the, the costs back as far as energy is concerned. But the question is how long is it also going to take to get the greenhouse gases back uh, in the relationship of the cuts that you have there versus how much it took to, uh, to build those in the first place. Great question. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker, and a very timely question from my friend. And I think uh, he is uh, right when he says, you know, government picking winners and losers uh, doesn't work. The more government funds this, that, or the other thing, the less innovation you're going to have. You'll always get some, there'll always be some innovation, but somebody's always going to innovate. But you would have more innovation, rapid innovation, when there is competition in the marketplace, and you're seeing that in the industry already. Technology is advancing quickly. Companies are adopting this technology because it is the right thing to do, and that makes sense. And when you talk about, you know, as my friend pointed out, some parts of the uh, renewable energy sector, you know, there, there are other, the other side of it, where sometimes with the deep earth mining, the GHGs that are responsible for that are, are actually worse in the long term. So I think this is where government has a responsibility to let the, the market decide, let companies invest in technologies they see as a winner, and therefore creating innovation in the marketplace. And they, we will get to our targets a lot quicker if government stays out of the way. Exactly. Questions and comments, the honorable member for... Uh Sorry. Uh, Calgary Centre. Well, Mr. Speaker, thank you for uh, recognizing me. And uh, I know this debate is just getting started, but quickly it's become clear to me that uh, it just seems that the New Democrats don't understand uh, the economy, and my Conservative friends do not want to do anything about the environment. And my my question to my good friend is, is twofold: when uh, when People look at doing things for the environment as being the most efficient, allowing for companies in different jurisdictions to make their own decisions around car uh, carbon reductions. The experts, and you talked about experts in your speech, the experts overwhelmingly say pricing carbon allows for that market flexibility in order to be able to reduce greenhouse gases. Why wouldn't he be supportive of a market-based system to reduce carbon and instead of just uh, pointing to a regulatory system that is increasingly more expensive and does not do as efficient a job as carbon pricing. The Honourable Member for Halbert and Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the uh, question from my uh, friend across the way. I did address that in my speech. There are companies all across Canada that are using technology innovation to help reduce their footprint. You look at most mining companies now, they're using battery operated vehicles instead of those used on fossil fuels and the list goes on and on. And they're doing this because this is the right thing to do. They're using doing this because they are using technology and innovation. They are using and adapting to this because this is what the market wants. Pricing a company out of the marketplace only pushes jobs and investment elsewhere. We are seeing that in many sectors, especially the oil and gas sectors. We are seeing company after company making billion, multi-million dollars, billion dollar investments elsewhere outside of our jurisdiction. And we, our energy sector is something we should be proud of. We have some of the toughest environmental and labor standards anywhere in the world. We should be promoting this, not running away from this. So, you know, if you want to price a company out of the marketplace, if you want to push investment out of the marketplace, I think that's totally the wrong way to go, 
but you will not have this investment that they, the Liberals are calling for, and my friend just mentioned. So we need to use more of the carrot than the stick to ensure that companies continue to lower their good greenhouse gas emissions and, and reduce their footprint. But like I've said, that is already happening. They do not need increased taxes, more regulation, more red tape for this to happen. It is already happening in real time. And while they continue to increase taxes, rules and regulation, investment is going elsewhere. In comments, the Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank um, my colleague from the Natural Resources uh, Committee for his speech. I was very happy to hear him speak uh, so uh, enthusiastically about the clean tech industry we have here in Canada that we, we need to nurture. We have a, uh, I just wanted to set the record straight, though, about what the NDP think of the oil and gas industry. We've never said we want to shut it down. We've never sh said we want to shut it down now. We know that we'll be using uh, oil and gas for years to come. But we think the, the government should be uh, giving uh, incentives and subsidies to the industries that will carry us into the future, the clean tech industries that he talked about. And, and also efficiency, energy efficiency. And I just wanted to bring up, I know I sound like a broken record here, uh, the eco-energy retrofit program that the Conservative government brought in uh, in 2007. It was one of the most successful programs that Canada's ever had that to tackle uh, energy efficiency. It invested over a number of years, almost a billion dollars, and leveraged uh, $5 billion uh, in and expenses that the people across Canada made. It's, it really had a huge effect on our carbon footprint and uh, on the pocketbooks of Canadians. And I just wondered if he could comment on why he thinks, first of all, why the Conservatives cancelled it, and second of all, why the Liberals haven't brought it back. Instead, they punted it off to the provinces and nobody's picked it up. Well, member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I do appreciate the question from my colleague on the Natural Resources Committee. He's a value member of the team, and I do uh, appreciate his uh, question very much. I do uh, want to talk uh, as much as I can in the time allotted to his question, one of which being uh, subsidies. And uh, I have a uh, few concerns about subsidies, especially when the money runs out. And I'll take this example here from the southwestern town of Tilsonburg, Ontario, Siemens Wind Plant recently closed. About 340 employees were out of work. And that was a result of when the provincial Liberal government in Ontario decided to take away the added subsidies for wind turbines or renewables that could be uh, solar panels, that type of thing. When the money ran out, the jobs ended. So that's why I'm very very cautious about the use of subsidies. I would rather tax credits going to individuals, whether they want to put solar power panels on their roof at their home, taking them off the grid, giving them the choice and the decision-making power of what works for them. Because as we all know, Speaker, if you choose winners and losers in the marketplace, most of that technology in the solar panels that are being used in Ontario can't be recycled. This is old technology being used, but there's no, there's no incentive to innovate or use better technology because the government is giving you that base rate no matter what. So it doesn't have to be the best product. It doesn't have to be the best technology. And when government does that, it stops competition. And competition makes everything better. Questions and comments. We have time for a brief uh, one of both, uh, the Honourable uh, Member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And and thank you to the Honourable Member for, for discussing the role of government in, in this discussion. I think it's important when we look at Ontario in particular, coming off the coal plant in Nanticoke, going from 53 smog days in 2005 to virtually no smog days since 2014, and how that was done because of a government decision in terms of the energy supply in Ontario. Would the Honourable Member not agree that the pipeline debate that we're having and the transitioning from subsidies to zero by 2025 will stimulate new inv innovation in Canada, looking for new energy supplies and new ways of delivering energy to Canadians. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, yes, uh, I do want to credit the uh, former 
Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario who started the ball rolling on getting rid of the coal-fired power plants right here in Ontario. And that's a good news story. I only caution the fact that we all know the story about the Green Energy Act that followed here on Ontario and the fact that we have some of the highest energy rates anywhere in North America, which is hurting competition right here in this once great province of Ontario, which used to be the manufacturing hub of this country. It is no more we no more hold that title, which is greatly unfortunate. So, you know, right now we are seeing Ontario having power we don't need in this, these extra Green Energy Act contracts that were given out. And so I'll, all I will say, Speaker, just give me two seconds, is don't pick winners and losers in the marketplace. Let the market decide. Competition makes things better. We will get there where we need to be at if we use that.